We're still waiting on uh, one of our speakers to show up, but uh, we're going to go ahead and start. It's a little bit after 7. Uh, he'll be here shortly, I'm, I'm sure. And uh, we would like to start out by asking uh, Mr. Tom Legman, uh, retired U.S. Army veteran, to stand and lead us in the pledge to the flag. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This time I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Bob Fulton from the Hamlin United Methodist Church to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to your throne of grace tonight, we ask your blessings upon us. We pray, O oh God, that you would give us some insight as we share and as we learn tonight. And we pray that you would empower us to make this community a better place. Lord, we ask that you would be involved with those that would be trafficking in drugs, and we pray that you would convert them or lead them out of this area. We pray, O oh God, for those that are addicted to drugs, that you might deliver them. We pray that you would show us as your people of how to, to help them and make this community better. And we just ask these favors tonight in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bob. I'm uh, overwhelmed to see this many people out tonight, and we want to welcome each and every one of you. Uh, I know some of you is from here in the Hamlin area, uh, right here in town, and some of you is from outside of town and, and that's good and I'm sure that all of us is here because we're fed up. So uh, Officer Jason Stanley is going to uh, say a few words and then I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's, uh, it is a privilege to stand here and see a great coming together of this community and this uh, small town of Hamlin. Uh, I've only been working here for six months, but I've had my hands full and I've been very busy. Um, some of you I know personally because of taking uh, complaints from you that you know, somebody done something to you or your property. But with that said, um, we're just going to lay a little bit of ground rules here. Um, a lot of people here are fed up, they're tired, um, they're aggravated of what's going on. With that said, if you have a complaint, you need to see me. I got paperwork that I want you to fill out. We're here to learn, to be educated, and that's what we're going to do. If we have complaints, we'll never get out of here. So if you have a complaint that you want to put forth, see me afterwards. I'll take you upstairs. I'll give you a piece of paper. We'll fill it out. We'll investigate and we'll go from there. Okay? At this time, I'll turn it back over to the mayor. Thank you all for standing. Uh, I just have a few words of comment before we uh, move on. And again, I, I'm uh, overwhelmed with this many being out uh, from Hamlin and the surrounding area. And as I said earlier, and as uh, Officer Stanley said, we are fed up. I'm sure that uh, it you all are as well as I am. I was joking around with uh, my friends from Bear Creek there before the meeting, and uh, I said, you know, good to see as many people out, and it didn't cost a thing to be here, but then after I thought it, some of you here tonight, it's cost you dearly. Some of you have paid the price in order to be here tonight because somebody has come along and, and took your belongings and stole things from you, so I uh, withdraw that phrase that it was free because some of you, it has cost to be here tonight, and I've lost many hours of sleep, and uh, we just have an epidemic here in town, and, and we're going to come up with some ways to work on it. Uh, questions and, and uh, comments, I do ask that maybe we hold off on them until uh, the end of the meeting, unless it's just something that you just absolutely have to ask somebody. But if you can hold off on them, uh, hopefully you brought paper and pencils, you can write those down and, and bring those forth later on in the meeting. And as Officer Stanley's done said, we're not here to hear a bunch of complaints about dogs barking, about people speeding, and things of that sort. 
We're here tonight to come up with some type of remedy, some type of help that uh, can get a grip on the the pill epidemic, the stealing epidemic, the meth epidemic, the things going on in our community. We don't need anything negative here tonight. The negative, if you think about it, the negative is already taking place. The negative part of it is already out there. We've done been hit with the negative part of it. So tonight, hopefully, we can come up with some positive things because two negatives, two negatives don't have no power. Any of you knows anything about current? You can't take two negatives and have any power. But you take a positive and you take a negative, then you've got some power. So that, that's what we want here tonight is some, is some positives. Uh, hopefully it'll be a learning tool for everybody here tonight, including myself. Um, it's for the public to learn how to, how to spot criminal activities, uh, how to better protect ourselves and our property. Um, as I've done said, the negatives are out there. We're here tonight to come up with some positive ideas. And uh, I, I do have some stats there that I laid on some tables. As you can see, I wasn't really expecting this many. But if you want copies of these, you let me know. And we'll run off copies and have them in the office. And you can stop by and get these. And the reason I wanted to run these off and share these with you is, is to give you an idea of just how often that countywide our police officers are called out. It's a, it's a continuous cycle, as you'll see on these papers. You should have three sheets there. If you don't have one, look off somebody else's. But the crime rate is what got my attention on page one. From 1996, the, the, now these are dispatched calls. Okay, keep that thought in mind. These are not calls that came into the offices. Like somebody, sometimes they call directly to the state police office, or they'll call the sheriff's office, or they'll call here or to the West Hamlin office. But these are dispatch calls from 911, two police officers countywide, and in 1996, there was 2,865. Okay, 2011, there was 5,525. Now somebody, you know, some people have been saying, I want to go back to the way it used to be. <laughs> and I'm just going to be blunt with you. I've done told you, I'm just going to lay it on the line, people. Well, I don't think it's ever going to be like it used to be. All of us here, anybody my age or over, I'm 50 something. 50, see? Yeah. 50 something. And I can remember as well as a lot of you all when we went to bed and left the doors open. Left the windows open. Yeah. You can't do that anymore. And, and, and it's not just a Hamlin thing. It's a county thing. It's a state thing. It's a country thing. You cannot do that anymore. So we can't go back to 1996. We can't go back to 1975. But that don't mean we've got to sit with our hands in our pockets and put up with it, okay? And, and I wanted you to hang on to these. The one that really got my attention, and you might want to notice, is page two the hours that these calls come in. If you ask somebody when do you think most police calls come in, they're probably going to say two, three, four o'clock in the morning. But that's not so. If you look on that paper, from four o'clock in the afternoon until 10 o'clock at night is when most of the calls come in. 386 on the average, and now this is from 2012, 386 average at four o'clock, 337 average at 10 o'clock, and around 400 in between there. So it's in the evening time. And as I looked at that and thought upon that, I would assume that a lot of this criminal activity is taking place when people are going about their regular business. You come home from work and you go to shopping, you go to a ball game, you go here, you do this, you're out for the evening. It's not late at night when you're in bed, but sometimes it's right during the middle of the day when you least expect it. So I wanted to share those hours with you. And also the last page is days of the week. And I'll tell you what got my attention about this one. You got Sunday through Saturday. And it's pretty much level. Sunday's average in 2012, 675 calls. Uh, Friday's, of course, 896. But it's pretty much level right across the board. It's 700, 800, 600. And you know, you, know you, you would think it would just mainly be Friday and Saturday. 
But as I looked at that, and what I got out of that is most of your criminal activities coming from people that don't work. Now I'll just be blunt with you. As I look around, I think I pretty much know everybody here. And, and you either work or you're retired or you, you work during your life. These people that come out and take our stuff, they don't work. So it doesn't matter to them if it's a Saturday or a Monday. And the reason I'm throwing this out there is because sometimes we let our guard down. We think, oh, it's Monday, it's Tuesday, there ain't nobody going to bother my lawnmower sitting there in the yard this evening. I'm going on down to the ball game, just leave it sit there. And you come home to the ball game, your lawnmower's gone. So it, it doesn't matter to a thief what day of the week it is. So hang on to those, and like I said, if you want copies of those, we'll get you some copies of them for your future references. Um, recently here in town, and this is when it started getting my attention, just here recently, in a month's time, between this guy on my left, this lady on my right, myself, and a few other employees here in the town, there was nine needles found just laying around in different spots. They were laying on the street. They were laying on a picnic table at the middle school. They were laying on the sidewalk. They were laying on the steps. We need to be more proactive in looking for things like that. If you see a needle laying around, don't just pick it up or walk on by, but call the proper authorities and have them to come and discard that and get rid of it. Probably never thought about going around looking for needles. I don't know if you know what a needle looks like. Most of them have little orange tips on them. Just kind of glance around for stuff like that. And we've got Trooper Fry here with us that's going to share some information with you here in a few minutes. And this might get your attention on meth making material. Did you know that you may have what you think is just a bag of trash that somebody threw out in your backyard? And you walk out there and you look at it and say, well, I want you to look there. Somebody threw their trash in my yard. There's a bottle of drain opener and a, and a battery and a pop bottle. That could be a meth lab. That could be leftover meth material. So one thing we need to do is start keeping our eyes open and looking around and watching for these things as he's going to share that information with you here in a few minutes. And again, the stealing is on the right. People are stealing our stuff to get money, to go buy their pills, to buy their meth. And we need to be a little bit more protective over our belongings. And hopefully uh, Officer uh, Napper will be here in a few minutes to share information with you on that. If he don't, I'll, I'll do it myself. But uh, those are some things we're going to cover tonight. I want you to take notes, and, and you're going to learn something here tonight. And I'll be back here in a few minutes to speak a few more minutes, and then we're going to open the floor on some ideas that you all may have. But at this time, I'm going to get out of the way, and we're going to call... Uh, Corporal Fry of the West Virginia State Police to come up and share some information with you. Corporal Fry. Thank you, sir. Corporal Fry, West Virginia State Police, obviously here in Lincoln County. My given name is David. You're welcome to call me that right now. Very few people probably going to know me. Uh, first of all, I, I want to reflect on a lot of what he was saying, and, and I'm mostly going to reiterate a lot of this. The most important thing he said that I always try to get across is this comes off as Lincoln County has a bad reputation. That's what we think. We live here. I don't live here anymore. I grew up in Lincoln County. That's one of the reasons I'm back here. This isn't, as he said, this isn't a localized problem with Hamlin. This isn't a localized problem with Lincoln County. You people aren't doing anything wrong. You aren't the butt of jokes. You shouldn't be. This is a statewide problem. And not only is it a statewide problem, this is a nationwide problem. Don't think that you're alone in this because you're not. That is very important. I, I, I'm very proud of where I came from, where I've gotten to, even though it's uh, very low. I'm still proud of where I came from and where I've gotten to. And I try to tell that to kids. I grew up in Hearts Creek. I say it every time I'm down there, I see some kid on the side of the road, and they, they almost feel hopeless, okay? We don't want that. I know this is mostly a church group. I want to try to carry myself to you guys. I'm going to stop saying things that I would say to other people. Uh, I am, because of my job, because of what we do every day, it's easy to become jaded. It's easy to become calloused against people's feelings and emotions. It's easy for me to step back and say, well, I've never been in this problem. I never had a drug problem. It's ridiculous that anyone else does. Uh, even I know that's wrong. Good people develop drug problems, and it progresses. Uh, and just like he said, all of our crime, I don't have any stats. I do this off the top of my head. I don't have any prepared notes. <clears throat> all of our problems in this county, we spoke of thieving and delinquency, and needles, which is an obvious one. 
I'm willing to spit 95% of these problems are the direct or vaguely indirect cause are drugs and drug use. Nobody's breaking into your houses nowadays. No one is breaking in and stealing your stuff so they can go buy milk and bread for their babies. That doesn't happen. It shouldn't. And if it does, then those are the people who really need to help. This is people that want drugs. They want to get high. They are hooked into it so bad. That is all they live for. And I'm not, I know very few people here probably know no one's names. This is their families. This is their friends. Me personally, I can't speak countywide stats. Probably 65, 70% of the calls I take, people being stole from, people being swindled, people having checks written, people having their identity stolen. It's their friends. It's their family. It's people that are in and out of their house every day. And, and here's what I need to say. This, people start with this, stealing from friends and family. You're targets of opportunity. When we ignore it, when we say, you know, Joe Joe is only 30 years old, he's trying to get his life straight, I don't want to call the police. Or if I do call the police and they get my chainsaw back, I don't want to press any charges because that's not going to help. Well, that emboldens people. And the person you think you're helping, they might not steal from you again, but they're going to go somewhere. Okay? I was in. Yeah. You know, when I, talk, when I spoke to the mayor, he wanted me to speak specifically about meth. Uh, because that's an the, the epidemic that's hitting us right now. I grew up in Hearts Creek. Uh, I graduated high school in 1996, 97, the exact same time frame that he was talking on our stats. I, I'm not looking at it through rose-colored jagged glasses. The worst thing, because I was in a bad area this county, believe it or not, Hearts Creek has a bad reputation for this county. Yeah, some of it deservedly so. I disagree with that. I disagree with the actual, I disagree with the sentiment, however, that is the perception. Uh, people smoke weed every now and then. Uh, kids get a hold of a bottle of whiskey. That's it. There were no pills. There were no Roxycontin, Oxycontin, Methadone, Methamphetamine. There was no heroin. There was nobody sticking a spoon in their driver's, in his driver's side of their car and cooking crack or meth as they're driving down the road to inject it. That just did not happen. We do not live then now. And as he said, we will never get back there. This stuff's here. It's not going to go away. Uh, as far as the methamphetamine production, that's the big thing. I was, I guess you could consider it classically trained in methamphetamine. When I came through and I started being a police officer, we're talking 10, 11 years ago, uh, if there's any people who watch television, I, I watch it. I, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, uh, Breaking Bad. People see this stuff and they think this is what meth labs are. It's pristine environments. It's big, large pieces of cookware and Bunsen burners and tubes and ventilation shafts. Well, guess what? When I first started doing this, that's mostly what we had. You maybe had one person out of 10,000 knew how to make this stuff. And it was very complicated. It was very expensive. If you messed your batch up, you're out a lot of money and a lot of time. That is not the case now. And as he just said, you know, I, I'm not picking on anybody. This gentleman right here has got a Powerade bottle. Everybody sees this Powerade bottle? Meth lab. That is all you need to see to think meth lab. Not Powerade. I'm not trying to get against cup of coal or anything. That's all it takes. That is what you're going to see. He's talking about your trash. I can tell people we've had, and you can't blame them. They don't know any better, and I wouldn't either. That people have pulled onto their parking lot. They found refuse in the back of their yard or on a creek bank, and uh, bring it in because someone's littering. And the way this methamphetamine works, it's all byproduct. It's not any good. It's still incredibly dangerous. And they will hook it to their truck and drive it to our office, and by the time they get there, we've got a scene because it's reacting. It's a chemical reaction. It's menthos and coke, but it's not sugar. It's acid and stuff that will kill you. Uh, that is the most important thing. The number one thing for you all today is realize this stuff is not safe, and if there's nothing else you take from it, do not pick this stuff up. If it looks like it's been laying there with snow on it in two months for three or four days, it is not inert if you pick it up and you shake it around and you look it up and you walk in the house and say, hey, man, Look what look at the think this is. And you throw it outside, it's going to start reacting, it's going to eat through the plastic, or you're going to have a problem. Okay? That being said, I, and I, I want to get kind of specific. I know I don't have a whole lot of time. We're talking about the items need to make meth. I could tell you and teach you how to make meth. That's probably not something I should do. Uh, I can tell you this, everyone knows how to use the internet. You can Google. How do I make shake and bake methamphetamine? And what I did before I came down here, that's exactly what I did. I went into Google. 
I typed in what ingredients do I need for shake and bake methamphetamine. The first response is a detailed message board post telling me everything I need, the prices, and the exact method needed to make it. And what I'm saying is, I'm not calling anybody stupid. We all have our things that we, we do well in life, hopefully. You don't need rocket scientists to do this anymore. You don't need people with college educations. You don't need people with high school educations. If you know how to bake a pie, you can make methamphetamine. If you don't know how to bake a pie, and you think you can do it by reading directions and following step by step, you can make methamphetamine. And the one part that I can't give a personal account of is once someone is at this point where they're using methamphetamine, where they're cooking up household toxic chemicals and injecting them into their body, there is nothing that these people will not do to get that high. You know, there's a very popular motivational video, and it's based on football, but it's pertinent in what the thing we do. And uh, some of you may have seen it, but the analogy it holds is you have to realize if you put yourself out in your, in your mind and you've got a 50 pound weight vest strapped to your back, and I march you at the gunpoint into the ocean so that the water is up over your nose and all you can do is barely get your nose above water. And all you want, the only thing that exists is a little bit of air. That's all you want. You have no other thoughts. You don't care what's for dinner tonight. You don't care who you got mad at at school today. All you want to do is breathe. You'll do anything. That is what this is like. When someone is on methamphetamine and they haven't had their drugs, it is a single consciousness. That is all they think about. You will not reason with them. You will not say, hey, this is wrong, man. You really need to not do this. They'll give you lip service. They don't care. Okay? And like I said, that's not me. Obviously, uh, you could probably tell, even without the uniform, I'm not exactly your candidate for methamphetamine use. I'm about 250 pounds. But that is all there is for these people. It's worse than heroin. And now, of course, I'm basing this on statistics and people that I've talked to. I can tell you who I've spoke to. Now, I've talked to people that have got off methamphetamine. It's not easy to do. Meth withdrawals will not kill you physically. You can live through them, but you don't want to. Uh, and that's what you have to realize. And I'm obviously not speaking to anyone here in particular. If it's a child, if it's a kid, a brother, a sister, an aunt and uncle, we've had meth labs from 16-year-old kids. I've had meth labs from 78-year-old men. It, it, it touches everyone, directly and indirectly. And you have to understand, sometimes the, the, the tough love aspect is going to be, it goes back to if somebody's stealing from you and you don't want to do nothing about it, we're going to go to other people. And it's the same thing. You, you, if you want to save someone that's doing this, you're going to have to hit them head on, and it's not going to be easy. It's not. It's not going to be hand them a motivational card or show them a video like I just quoted, and they're going to be okay. This, this is incredibly difficult. And it's something, I have an addictive personality. I drink maybe a pot of coffee a day. I know it's terrible for me. But that's also the reason that I never, as a child, even growing up in Hearts Creek, I, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, never did any drugs. One, I wanted to be a trooper my entire life. I knew that's probably not conducted to me getting my profession. Two, I knew, I, I knew it. I knew I had an addictive personality. I'm, I've been hooked on caffeine since I was 14 years old. I'm not putting myself through that. And I can't imagine. I know what it's like when I wake up and I haven't had a cup of coffee. Because you know what? It's all on my mind. My wife's talking, my kids are looking at me, stuff's going on, the dog wants outside, whatever, coffee. Got to get my caffeine, I have to have it. And that's exactly what these people are doing, only to a lot less comical, a much more severe extent. Okay? What he said about the, the ingredients, the stuff you might be looking for, the stuff that might be disappearing out of your cabinets for methamphetamine. A lot of you probably have done some research, knowing you're coming here today. There's only one thing that you need to make methamphetamine that you can't walk in and with no ID and buy. And that, of course, is pseudofed or pseudofed, something, some type of federal based nasal decongestant or when you're sick, something like that. You know, that we have a database for that. When you buy pseudofed over a certain amount, uh, you're going to go into a database. If I have real suspicion of probable cause, I can look your name up and it'll tell me how many boxes of pseudofed you bought. If in the last five years you bought seven boxes of pseudofed, you're probably not making meth. Uh, but that, you know, like we said, you all know me now. We're pretty good friends. Everybody knows my name, where I'm from. If I walk up and say, man, listen, I've been sick for a couple of days. Uh, I ain't got no way to get to the store. Do you care to run up to Rite Aid on your next trip? I'll give you $10 for gas. When you buy me a box of soup, fed, I, my wife's nose is killing her. And we just we both go run down and terrible. 
you'd probably do it. If we've known me for a while, and we're buddies, if you don't know what's going on. And that's the only thing that's controlled that you need to make this stuff. And before I get done, I said I don't want to take up all this time. I'll go ahead and give you a quick little rundown of the kind of stuff that, if you don't know, that we're using to make this drug that's going to you know, end your life the way you know it. I said Sudafed, Sudafed. Like everything else in life, was created with a good purpose. Like all the other drugs, like OxyContin, pain meds. And there's a reason it's there. Uh, we just abuse it as a population. So, of course, this is it. It has a good purpose. I'll take it. It bothers me. If I get stuffed up, use it. That's it. Yeah? Well, lie. Anybody know what lie is? Okay. You're about halfway there. Uh, ammonium nitrate. That, you're like, whoa, ammonium nitrate? Sh surely. No. You can't. There's no way you can buy that. If anybody's got a first aid pack, you got a cold press at the house. So when your kid bumps his elbow, you can throw a cold pack on there. When you break it open, like I keep in my cruiser, that's what's in that. That's what causes that combination to happen. That's all you need. Uh, Coleman's camping fuel. I got two bottles at my house. It's always there. I go camping all the time. Uh, that's one of the other things you need. Uh, let me see. Uh, in a bottle. Plastic bottle. Soda stream bottle. Gatorade bottle. Not Gatorade. Everybody knows Gatorade bottles are like kind of double triple thick compared to a normal little water bottle. Uh, you can rinse them out and use them again. The chemicals won't eat through it the first time. So that's a popular choice. Uh, for a batch of methamphetamine for the mayor and I to share, if we were needing both of us a hit, two AA lithium batteries. Two batteries is enough to start cooking. Uh, a couple of bottles of water. Hydrochloric acid. Again, four or five years ago when I started learning this new shake and bake method, I'm like, how to quit gas with that Mythbuster stuff? I can't, I can't get, you can't. Go to Lowe's, they sell some gallon jugs. You can, you can buy, you don't need to show an ID. It's $8. You, you can have it. Acetone, buy some acetone Lowe's. Pay for it, pay for it. Uh, you know, and then for us, people, we have stuff we have at the house as far as the tools. Uh, some coffee filters, power pliers, some pipe cutters, a mason jar. There's probably a few of us that have that kind of stuff around. Phone, a blender, and a one fourth cup measuring cup. That's it. That's all you need to make methamphetamine. And again, it starts out, the first step in making methamphetamine is literally take some Epsom salt, spread it on a cookie sheet, and bake it at 400 degrees. That's how complicated this is. And that's why it is overrunning us. We've done a good job. I know, I, I'm sure no one else is here. Four years ago, maybe, I came down here, prescription pill abuse rampant. We could not get in front of it. Could not stop it. Pill mills, doctor shopping, it was everywhere. We had some stuff change. We shut down a bunch of pill mills. We made it so it's a lot harder to crush and change the chemical composition of OxyContin. It's not as easy to abuse now. People take the path of least resistance. That's too hard to do now. Of course, people are still doing that. People are still going up the mountains to grow marijuana. But again, that's a small minority. We're talking path of least resistance for me to get high. And right now, it is what everybody is hearing as shake and bake methamphetamine. Okay, and, and that again, another important aspect, it is just so easy to make and you don't have to be very intelligent to do it. And obviously if you're using it, you're making some bad life decisions, you're probably not in a good mental place anyway. Uh, I know they said no many questions. I, I have very few uses. Uh, I enjoy working with narcotics. I've done a, a little while. I've worked in Logan, and I, I should have made that when I first stepped up here when I was talking about not being a Lincoln County thing. I've been stationed in Logan and Williamson. I've been stationed in Wayne County in uniform, doing what I do here in Lincoln County. And I spent a very short, albeit very, it, it was very pressed. I learned a lot of things in about a year and a half on a federal drug task force. And that's when I started seeing, that is when it opened my eyes to it wasn't just bad people. It wasn't just like a movie with people standing in the shadows with the hood and a backpack and you're like, that's the bad guy. He's doing bad things and ain't like that. This stuff, like I said, can get its hooks in people. And once it does, they are in for a very long ride. And so are their family, and so are their friends, and so are the communities that they're in. And, Mayor, you got anything else you want me to add to any of this? Iodine, is that a? Iodine can be used. Like I said, this particular thing I'd said, this is their most common method now. Uh, there are still people who are using things such as iodine. Uh, you'll hear a lot about red phosphorus. 
Uh, a lot of people think that's the red tips on matches. It's not. We don't need the matches. We need those strike plates. Strike plates off boxes of matches. If you have an old stove and you keep a bunch of boxes of matches around, that stuff's gone. You need to check. You think you got some family members, some friends coming in your garage? Go check at Coleman Camping Fuel. See if it's there. See if you're missing some bottles of water. See if you see if you had a first aid kit at your house or your car like I do. Open it up. See what's in there. See if the tweezers, the cotton balls, the thread, and the cold compress is missing. Because if it is, then you got a problem. And that, and that's something you need to be able to identify. Uh, Oh, yeah, that, that, that's no problem. It's not, it's not as easy. Again, we always go back to that. And, and this is one thing, again, not naming no names, not saying all oh, you people here do this or any of you people here do this. Like she said, here's the biggest thing we need to catch people. We need, I'm one person, and I'm out here in this county maybe eight, nine hours a day. Uh, you guys are here all the time, man. All the time. You see it, you know these people, you know when somebody starts acting different. You know when something's going on. And, and like to get back on that, I'm not saying that you know you have to be narcs or snitches as the young children like to call it, but without information from you guys, I don't have a job. Plain and simple. I, I don't get paid. They won't pay me my full salary to go here and write people warnings for rolling through stop signs. I gotta do something else. And I have to have people help me to do that. That's just how it is. Anytime you see us actually make an arrest on meth, 99.9% of the time, somebody that's never gonna get any credit. A civilian, a citizen, a concerned parent, friend, someone has given us the information we needed to get there and do that. And like she said, as far as the, the prosecution, if we can catch them, well, that's fine. We'll prosecute them. I'll charge everyone that does it with three felonies because they're going to commit three felonies in the process of making methamphetamine. But it's not like it was. Like I said, when I used to have to get search warrants and make drug buys and I could kick a door in on a house, and when I went in there, there was this huge, elaborate meth lab. But there was no chance they were going to move it out of there. I mean, we're talking hundreds of pounds of equipment. It was going to be there. It wasn't going nowhere. Those were easy for me. When we get a tip that says somebody's got some shake and bake meth in a backpack up in the wood line two miles from the house, that's hard for us to get to. It really is. And, I, and, and that's why we're getting a lot of this being thrown off on people's houses and, and dumped out. It is a very time sensitive thing. Again, I don't think I touched on it. Total process for this, maybe two and a half hours from start to finish for me to go from putting all this junk together to me and my buddies hitting the wood line doing whatever we want to do with their men. Very time sensitive. It's not like it used to be with these big old facilities that we used to get a bust into. And I'm not going to make any excuses for why we can't arrest more people because we're trying. Uh, and I hope everybody knows that we are. And I'm not just speaking for myself. I work every day with the guys here in Hamlin. I work every day with the sheriff's department. I work every day with all these DNR. We got a couple of DNR guys out here right now that we joke with and this and that. And guys, they're, just, they're doing the same things we're doing. They're busting meth labs out here in the woods because that's where this stuff's going now. You got a good group of people here, and I'm not, I, I'm not just, I'm not even speaking about me. You got a bunch of police officers here. You got a good bunch of people that are from here. Have we? We got guys that came here out of the academy to Lincoln County. That, they couldn't even point to it on a map. They've been here for eight years, they're not leaving. They like it here, they like the people. They like, they like the benefits of what we have out here. And we greatly appreciate your help. As what, as what, go ahead, sir. David, why don't you tell them a little bit about what the people that's on this map, what they look like, the, some of the symptoms. Yeah, again, when it, when, it, when it gets to the point of what we would think of as a meth addict, we're all going to be able to spot it. You know, you want to have, methamphetamine can be used a bunch of ways. It can be smoked, it can be snorted, it can be inserted into body cavities, it can be what is most popularly done, injected into a vein in your arms. Um, and usually that's a progression. Most people don't start out the first time they ever did a drug by injecting something into them, whether it's you know, pills or heroin or meth or whatever. But uh, they're going to get there because it's such more of an, it's such a better high, so more intense if they can inject it. And at that point, you got to realize all the stuff I talked about, all this acetone and common fuel, it's poison. It's poison. You're going to see incredible amounts of dramatic weight loss. You're going to see a severe drop in immune systems. People are going to be sick. They're going to have runny nose. Their eyes are going to be bloodshot. And it's just never going to go away. You're going to see shakes and tremors from withdrawal. People don't have this kind of stuff. 
you're going to see the inability to concentrate. You're going, you know, a lot of you're talking to me and, and I can't keep on subject. I'm just, I'm over here. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You talk to me for five minutes and I come back to whatever it was I was trying to make a point of 20 minutes ago. You're, you're going to see that kind of stuff. But, and like you said, that's what we're going to get to. When you see somebody on TV or you see these newspapers with the comparison photos of before meth, three years later, after meth, you're like, oh, wow. Yeah, they're on meth. I don't give up on people, but those people, it's going to be hard to save them. The people that it's going to be easier to save are the people that have just started out. Yeah. The ones that have just, they're 20 years old, they were doing some pills. One time they thought they were getting some ecstasy, but it was actually meth because there is no real ecstasy anymore. And then they realized they had meth, and that wasn't so bad. And, and like I said, that's the physical part of it. But what you got to realize, too, no one that I've ever met started out on this drug or any drug with the goal of I can't wait to be such a junkie that I rob from my family and all I think about is getting high. Everyone, we all do it. Everybody thinks, everybody but me. Nobody else can handle this. They're not as strong as I am. I can do this, but you, you can't. You can't. Go ahead. Does it have a distinguishable odor to it? As far as in the cooking process? Well, it does. It does, and, and but, you know, not that it does. And it's one of those things that's hard to describe. And again, I'm not trying to make anybody admit anything. If you've ever smoked burnt marijuana, somebody smoking marijuana, you never forget it. Um, once you've been around that scent, it, it's very hard to get away from. You can try to compare it. Everybody perceives stuff different. It can smell like a litter box that needs change. It's that acidic aroma, overwhelming. But, you know, I've got called on before and overwhelming aromas and went in and somebody had a little paint in their house and they hired somebody to strip all the paint outside inside their house. And you know, guess what? That smells a lot like a meth lab. Uh, you know, but so yeah, there is, there are distinct smells, but there's not anything I can tell you, hey, it smells like blank, and, and it's going to be a 100% thing. Go ahead, ma'am. You might want to touch a little bit on how it affects children's safety, the homes that you've been in. Oh, well, yeah, again.